Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for bringing us here this morning, Father God in heaven. Thank you for this, men, the guys that are here. I love these guys. I think about them. I pray for them, as you well know. This list of guys that, um, that Norm brought from 2003 of all the guys, it's amazing, all these people that have been on the prayer list and coming and going in our lives. I, I remember how difficult it is, Lord, you know, for me to take people off of the list and put them on the list and when I should do that, Lord. And, and just the, the feeling in my heart for the people and their families and what's going on in their lives. And it's all about you because it, it would never be me. I'm so selfish. I was so self-centered and everything. I still fight that battle, you know, every day. And yet, Lord, your spirit comes through me and in me and these guys. And we love each other. And we pray for each other. And it's all because you love us more than our sin. It's because you came, Jesus. Father, you sent Jesus. And Jesus, you came as the Lamb of God. You gave your blood and your body. You went to the cross, took the wrath of the Father on, on our behalf to pay for our sin. And then you walked out of that grave on the third day. You rose from the dead and you defeated the power of sin and death in our lives. You made us born again children of the living God. Our name's written in the book of life for eternity. And we are so thankful. I am so thankful. So bless these men today. Those that are on the Zoom call, those that are here in the room, we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Praise God. Well, guys. I, uh, I, I think about what we're, what we're studying now is John 15, which is one of the most meaningful passages in the Bible for me. And the book of John is the most meaningful. I love the book of John, okay? The Romans and John. And well, I like Philippians too. And, and um, I love Ephesians, the first two chapters. Ephesians is just unbelievable. Um, and the, just the joy of God's word and what he has for us and how he brings it to us. And then how he, his Holy Spirit makes it real, and the Holy Spirit works through us as the, it talks about in the 15th chapter that we are the branches and, and Jesus is the vine. And, and it's so wonderful to think about how the sap goes through to produce the fruit, which is the Holy Spirit is constantly flowing in and through us, and it's all about Jesus. And for us to stay connected and not be separated from the Spirit, you know, the, the things that keep us from Him, even though He's there, we're not functioning as we should and because of the sin in our lives and the things like that. So I'm, let me go through these, these thoughts that we have here and, and the thing. And, and before we do that, um, what I want to do is I'm going to read John 15 again to us. And I, if you guys at the tables, you've got it there on, on the email that I sent out to all you guys at Zoom. Uh, let's just do that. It says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. <clears throat> no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, and you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I want you to remember that. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So many of us are having troubles in our lives, and I don't want to start preaching on this now, but the problems and the difficulties we have when we get away from Jesus and we're not connected, it's, it's very difficult. So here we are, apart from me. Um, let's see. Here we go. I knew I'd do that. Where did I leave off? Six. Six. Okay. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withered. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. There it is. To my Father's, what? Glory, showing yourself to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. So right there, he's telling us, that's how you're connected. That's how you stay connected. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Most of the things we deal with it takes away our joy. But he says, if you're with me, you'll have my joy. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. 
You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name. For they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had, if I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in the law. They hated me without reason. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify. You also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. And it's the most wonderful. Praise the Lord. The Lord's word, Lord, let your Holy Spirit take that word and penetrate our hearts with it. I want to hit some high points on that. And I want, I want to focus so that we don't get off track, how important it is to remember that everything, and I want to say this, this as clearly as I can, everything is about Jesus Christ. I'm going to say it again. Everything is about Jesus Christ. Now, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm a golfer, so I play with different people at different times, and you don't know that you don't know them that well, and you just get to meet them or whatever. And every once in a while, we'll have a conversation, something to go along, you would be walking along, you would be talking, or after the round, or you find people like in business, I'm in business dealings all the time, negotiations or consulting or whatever, and you have conversations that go on. And every once in a while, when it's appropriate, because I'm focusing about Christ as I'm in the meetings, I'm doing it, I'm praying, I'm praying for the guys when I'm playing golf, I'll just be sitting there looking at a guy and I'll start thinking about his swing or he did something good or I'll say, oh, great shot. But then I'll think to myself, Lord, and you can tell by being with him, he's not a Christian. They say, Lord, I pray for his soul, his golf game is nice and dandy, but that, that it is his soul for eternity, I pray for. And I'm sitting there praying for him, okay, while he's throwing his club down or, you know, using the Lord's name in vain or whatever. I'm just praying that God would touch him with the Holy Spirit and bring him to him. And then in, in an appropriate time, wherever, I'll say, oh my gosh, praise the Lord, you know, or something. I'll make a birdie or I'll hit a great shot. I'll say, you know, outstanding. What a blessing. I'll say, like, what a blessing. I'll say, what a blessing. And they can't argue about that and get all weird. And then I say, what a blessing. They said, it's, I said, I look at him and I look him right in the eye. Because then they look at me and they smile. You know, they know I'm happy. I did something really good. And I go like this. And I said, yeah, what a, it's all about Jesus. Everything is about Jesus Christ. Praise God. And then I just move on. Now, they, they, they don't. It doesn't really. What happens is, in my mind, at any given moment, and I do this, I remember in business deals where that's happened, you know, everything's this and that. Oh, that was a great call. Hey, guys, we got over the hump. Looks like we're going the right direction. What a blessing. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. What a blessing. You see, I don't want to, it, it, what the Lord has taught me after like some 40 years of teaching the Word of God and reading the Bible is that everything is about one person and one God. It's not about some generic God. It's not like saying, oh, thank God. Well, which God are you thinking? You know, it's Jesus Christ focused on him. And when the Holy Spirit comes, you've got a lot of people that are Holy Spirit Christians or Holy Spirit churches, Holy Spirit this and all that. Hey, guys, the Holy Spirit came for one reason, because that Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ's spirit. And it came to bring us knowledge about Jesus, focus on Jesus, for us to follow Jesus, for us to worship Jesus. It's all about Jesus Christ. So the first thing we want to know if we read John 15 is what? It's all about Jesus, the vine, right? In other words, it says the father's the gardener, you know, and he's working to take that vine. And that vine is our family tree, as they say, our, you know, all the branches that come off of that. And then your fruit, which is your kids, and they come and they get to be branches and the whole thing. 
So God says, and the other thing, did you notice that he said in here, which we're going to talk about this in more detail, but he says, when you, when you love me, you obey me. Did you hear what he said? If you love me, you obey me. If you're connected with me, you love me, you obey me. And then he said, if you do that, guess what? You're, you're, I'll give you peace. I'll give you peace. You know, peace that the world can't understand. And of all the people, I think about this, Jesus is saying, I'll give you my peace. Now think about Jesus' peace, okay? Now here's a guy who ends up on a cross. And on the way to the cross, all the things that happened to him. And to him, that's the joy and peace. And he wants you. Did you notice that it didn't say you weren't going to have all those problems? In fact, he says, take up, the, take up your cross and follow Christ. That's what Paul says. Die to self and live for Christ. So what happens is if you're having problems, that doesn't mean God left you. It doesn't mean God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean that he's not answering your prayers. It means that you need to look to him for your joy and your peace so that you don't have to strike out against the world and all the people because you just need to trust God and keep going. And when you do that, now this is what's, what's absolutely mind-blowing, is he promises this in uh, Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice always, I'll say it again, very, rejoice, let your gentleness be evident to all. Whoa, you mean I can't get angry and scream and cuss and, and get weird? No, let your gentleness be evident to all. For the, now, this is why. In the midst of your nightmare situation, the Lord is near. He's with you. What do you mean he's with me? Everything's going wrong. He's with you. The Lord is near. Now watch. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and petition. And here's the key, which is so, if you look at the, the logic of spiritual darkness, this is so bizarre to the people who have no spiritual light, no vertical truth. This is so bizarre. He says, listen to this. He says that the peace of God, he says, I want you to open the key, the door to the peace of God. What is it? Thankful. Prayer and petition with thanksgiving in the midst of a nightmare. How could you be thankful for this? Everything's coming apart. Everything. How could you be thankful? Because I know that God's with me and he's not going to leave me or forsake me. I know that he's going to take care of me. I know he's going to get me through this. I know that he has a plan. I don't understand it. I don't know what he's doing, but I know he's doing it, and I am going to trust him. And he says this in what? Romans what? He's, well, let's go back to Philippians. He says, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God, and the peace of God, which is what we're talking about here, the peace of God, which is beyond understanding, will guard your hearts and minds and Oh, where are they going to guard your hearts and minds? At the bank? With a nice little vacation? Your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It's going to be all about Jesus is where you're going to get your... your goal. So it, it goes on and on. I, I, there's so many things. I mean, my mind is just going crazy. But let me go back to the notes, and then we'll, we'll work our way back down. But this 15th chapter of John, don't take it lightly. This is, this is where you hook up and you connect. And you understand what it, need, what it means to walk with Christ, to abide with Christ, to identify with Christ. We're going to talk about that. So, uh, number one, I say, Jesus Christ is the true vine of God, the Father. Uh, I love this. The Father who maintains, he, he maintains, the Father, he maintains the, the Christian family vine. The Christian family vine, like the Christian family tree and, and all that goes on. The born-again Christians are connected to the eternal vine of God by the work of the Holy Spirit. So you don't connect yourself. The Holy Spirit, and we talk about being born again. This is really important. Let me set, read number three. To be born again is to be in Christ, in quotes, in Christ through faith in his death on the cross to pay the price for our sin and his resurrection on the third day to defeat the power of sin and death in our lives. And when you become a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit. This is not the baptism that you do when you go in the water and baptize, this is the Holy Spirit comes and baptizes you or borns you. You are born by the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus talks to Nicodemus and he says, the wind blows as it blows because Nicodemus says, how could I be born again? And Jesus says this, he says this statement that is very difficult if you don't read the word of God and study it. And that is that the spirit of God comes and does what he wants, when he wants, with who he wants. And that's how you're born again. The Holy Spirit comes upon you and touches your heart 
and brings you to the realization that you need to, now it's faith, your faith, from your perspective, it's faith. From God's perspective, it's the Holy Spirit coming upon you. He chooses, you receive, and you respond. And when you do, you become connected. He says, says this, he says, you're born into the eternal family of God. The Father has given all of us grace and mercy. Now, I'm going to talk about that for a minute by bringing us into relationship with Jesus Christ for our eternal salvation. That's what it means to be effective. And that is explained wonderfully in the first two chapters of Ephesians. I mean, really wonderfully. And in the fifth chapter of uh, Romans, uh, Paul says that even when we were enemies of God, Jesus died on the cross for our sins and made us. And that's because, now listen, we all have enemies, people, it, it's so difficult for us, and we're so frustrated, then what happens? What happens is this, is that mercy, we need the mercy and grace of God. So what is the mercy? The mercy is that God doesn't destroy us in our sin. In other words, we don't even deserve to even have an opportunity because we've already sinned, but he doesn't give us what we deserve so that his grace can come upon us. And he, we can be blessed. So he goes on like this. He says, he says, when you become a child of God, then you're born again. It is the Father's will for us to be identified with Christ, to abide in him in every area of our life. It says, and the Father's uh, will for us as branches is to remain in the vine, Jesus Christ, so that we can produce much spiritual fruit that will last for eternity, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. This is really important. Fruit isn't something that you generate. You go out and you do this, you do that. It is the Holy Spirit living through you that produces the fruit. I was talking to Pete this morning about the uh, prayer. I had my morning prayer as an example and the, and the Psalms that I pray each morning. Before I pray for you guys, before I pray for my family, before I pray for my business, for, for, I pray for my health or healing for you or somebody else or the ministry, the first thing I do is I, go, I, I spend this time praying this prayer in the morning to establish where I am in Christ and who he is and the Lord and Father, Son, and Holy Ghost and, and all that's going on. So I pray that on purpose so that my attitude and my mind and my heart can just, I could just let all of what's happened through the night and the day before just flow out of me. And then I have these Psalms that I pulled out, okay? And I pray these Psalms through. And by the time I'm done, then I'm about ready. Now I'm ready to pray. You see, I wasn't ready to pray because I wasn't completely in the spirit focused on the word of God because my problems were so great. I had to just acknowledge who God is. That means, so if you want to think of that beginning part of my life, of my day each day, and I try to make sure that it never doesn't happen. And the reality is that's my acknowledgement of the fear of the Lord in my life. And the fear of the Lord is when you give up everything to God. You give up, you give up all your desires. You give up all the of the circumstances and situations. You give up all the techniques and the, and the things you're gonna do. You give up all the responsibility for everything. You give up all the results to everything. And you, you just say, Lord, you are God and I'm not. So basically that's it. The basic fear of the Lord concept is you're God. You created everything. Everything is running and, you, and we have responsibility to you as our creator God and I am not God. Even though I feel like in my own life, I want to be my own God. I want to do what I want to do. I want to do it when I want to do it. I want to say what I want to say. Oh, I got to say this. I'm so angry I want to do this. Or I've got to do this and I got to do that. The reality is in the fear of the Lord, you don't got to do that. In the fear of the Lord, you can think, of, okay, well, that's what I want to do. And I feel like that. Now, what does God want, now, what does God want me to do? Now, here's the, here's the misnomer that comes out. And you learn this after years and years, is you would think that if you're reading the Word of God, you're studying the Word of God, you love God, you're, you're, you're giving, you're working and everything, that, that you, would, not, you would, would stop wanting to say the wrong things. You would stop wanting to do the wrong things. You would stop reacting the wrong way. And you get so disappointed and think there's no God around and God's not working and God's not with you because you still have these, you know, and God says, no, 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 you don't get it. When you focus on me and it's all about Christ and you're connected, then the fruit, but the, the tendency, I talked to somebody about this yesterday, the day before, the tendency to do all the things that you and I know that are destructive and, and ruin everything, it's still there. It's called the flesh. It's called the old nature. 
And the one thing, the difference between a born again Christian and a person who's not born again is that when you have all those things happen to you, if you, now listen carefully, this is really important. When you're a Christian, you have a choice. When you're not a Christian, you don't have a choice. When you're not a Christian, you do whatever you think is in your best interest. You may stop screaming. You may be a nice person. You may put up with all kinds of things. You may, be, you may look like the perfect person, but you did it for a different motive. You did it to make yourself look good. You did it to make yourself feel good about yourself. You did it for some purpose. But when you do it and, you, and you're a Christian and you come and you say, Lord, this isn't how you, and you, and you say, I don't know what to do. And then you say, but I'm going to trust you and pray then, and give me your power. Then the Holy Spirit comes and works through you to change how you respond and what's going on. And then that brings honor and glory to the Father because now that's the fruit of the Spirit. And, you, you know, Christians, I don't know what happened to me. I don't know. And the answer is, you took your eyes off Jesus. Were you thinking about Jesus when you were, went into that bar and started hanging out with all the guys and drinking and, oh, I'm not going to do anything bad. I'm not going to, I was just in there because the, I never go to the bars, but so-and-so is retiring and they're all having a special thing and part of the guys and I went there and I said, okay, well, and, and then, you know, the, the third drink and the girls and the stuff and, and how you ended up doing what you did and where you were and all that happened. Did you, I, and you're praying, Lord, I didn't mean to do that. Lord, I didn't want to do that. No, 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 no. When you were in there, were you waiting when you were talking to the guys for a moment to talk about Jesus? Did you, when you went in there, it doesn't matter. You can go in anywhere. You can go into any place you want. Jesus hung out with all the prostitutes and the drinkers and the whole thing. He didn't have a problem, but he always knew who he was. Jesus always knew who he was. Jesus always knew who the Father was. Jesus always connected with the Father and his will. He knew why he came. Do you know what you're do you know why you're in a group of people that are your friends? Do you know why you're at a party? Do you know why you're over here? Because when you're connected, the vine and the branch, there's a reason for you being everywhere. You're not excluded from anywhere. You're just when you go there, everything's about Jesus Christ. You are a representative of Christ. You identify with Christ. Now I want to read you something that um, I think is important. And I, and I, I'm a couple of statements here, and I want you to think about these. We're going to, we're just going to, this is sort of something we're going to be working on for the next few weeks, like I said. But if you remember in Mark 8, 34 to 20, uh, 38, this is what Jesus said. I want you to hear this clearly. He says, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must, de must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now listen carefully what he says. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And what does that mean? That means that you have a life and you can do whatever you want and you're in charge, right? That's your life. But when you take that life and you put it under the authority of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, then you are losing that life and you're giving it to Christ. That means to die to self, live for Christ and die to self. He goes like, um, he says, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel, notice he said, for the gospel will save it. What is the gospel? It means for Christ Jesus, the, the essence, because Jesus is the gospel. Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the good news. It's not just saying Jesus Christ. It's saying Jesus Christ who died for your sins and who rose from the dead. And when you call upon him, you have eternal life. It's not just, I'm a Jesus guy. I got my Jesus sticker. And you're a Buddha guy. And you're a this a guy. And you're a woke guy. And you're this. And everybody's cool. Let's have another beer. That's not it. Jesus Christ, the gospel, it means you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. There's only one God. And if you don't turn to Christ, you're on your way to hell. And Jesus came and he loves you more than your sin. And I'm so thankful. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And the guy goes, okay, I've had enough of that. I don't need that. I don't even believe in sin. Let's see. I talked to a guy the other day. <clears throat> I've been praying for this guy, I, I must say, 35 years. I don't want to say how we're connected because then somebody will figure it out. Somebody who knows him will talk to him. Well, I, I just, I'm going to do this. Let me tell you the story. So this guy studied all kinds of religions. He's done everything. And he's a hard-nosed guy. And he always is poking me on the Christianity thing, you know. You really believe this and you really believe that. And, and, and he stay old. Tell, he just because he wants and he attacks me every part of the Bible. So you got to really know your Bible, okay, with a guy like this. 
really got to know your Bible. And always, and what I always do is when he attacks me on something here or there or the other place, you know what I do? I come to him and I always bring Jesus into the equation. I always talk to him about how Jesus is this and how Jesus is this and how Jesus is that. And then, and then I went, you know, we talked and I shook his hand. I was leaving him the other day and I said, I want you to know, man, I'm still praying for you every day. <laughs> yeah. He says, I don't believe, he says, I don't believe there's eternal life, reincarnation or anything. So don't worry. Don't, don't, don't bother. I said, his name is Charlie. I said, hey, hey I, it doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter. That's a big leap. Oh, well, there's no proof or anything. I said, here's the proof. The sun comes up. You're created. The world is here. Where did it come from? It came from somewhere from eternity past. And if there's somewhere from eternity past, there's an eternity future. That's what we're talking about. I'll pray for you. It's all about Jesus. See you later. Out the door. See, in the old days, I'd sit there and argue with the guy, and he'd do this and do that. I, I don't have to do that because I know. Now, this is, this is what I know. This is what I've learned. And uh, Joe and I were talking about his life and how God worked in his life and done all kinds of things. And when you look back, it's easier for Joe looking back, right, than looking forward or you're in the middle of the mess, right? You're in the bud puddle. It's always better to look. You can look back and, and see how God, because the Holy Spirit is doing what? He's working all the time in your life and my life through all of the horrible things and all the good things. And it's all about who? It's about Jesus Christ so that you can remember. Now, let me read the rest of this because this is really, really important. Verse uh, 36, this is Mark 8, 36. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Like Gene and I, we talk to guys every once in a while and say, well, Gene, I'll see you in 10,000 years, man. And, you know, we're talking to very wealthy guys and guys who are pretty cool. They got it together and everything. And they go, 10,000 years? You know, what about 100 years? Why? I said, no, we don't want to do something you can understand. We want to do something that's going to blow your mind. 10,000, where are you going to be in 10,000 years, you know? What's going to be happening in 10,000 years? Because if you start to begin to think about eternity, guess what happens? The fear of the Lord comes upon you. You see, the fear of the Lord is the thing, is thinking, oh, my gosh, maybe there is a God. Or maybe I ought to think about this. Maybe there, maybe it's not all about me. You know, that kind of a thing. Uh, you, what's the old saying? There's no, uh, there's no atheist in foxholes. Okay? So here's what God says. He says, you don't have to be afraid of dying. I've overcome death. You can trust me for everything, not only for your food every day, for your wife and your kids, but you can trust me into death. You can walk right through death. There's no sting. You'll come from life to life. That's what it means. That's why it's so important to talk about Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is life eternal. That's what it's all about. So fear of death will destroy everything. It'll destroy your freedom. It'll destroy your country. It'll destroy your joy. And God says, I came to give you what? Peace of mind and joy and complete joy because you don't have to be afraid of dying. So the one distinctive, now listen carefully. This is really critical. The very one distinctive that we as Christians who identify with Christ need to have in the world today is to show that we are not afraid to die. We're not freaked out like everybody else is because we know Jesus. This is about you and I having an attitude of focusing and identifying with Jesus Christ and his death and his resurrection and our eternal hope. So let me finish this here, and we'll look at this. In verse 36, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Now listen, or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone, here's the key words, here we are, listen carefully. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. How, you think we're there? Adulterous and sinful generation? He says, anyone, listen to me, is ashamed of me, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Whoa. So here we have Christians, quote-unquote Christians, who do not want to... I, talk about Jesus over here, and I don't want to talk about Jesus here. You know, we're at, we're at the, you know, I'm at the meeting here, and I've got this all going over here, and 
In other words, they could be in a group. They could be part of a, of a organization. They could be in a group and they could be there for 10 years doing all kinds of things. And people in there would never even know they were Christians. They say, well, I, I treat everybody nicely and I do this and I do that. That's great. You should do that. And you should be, and you should let the Holy Spirit lead you. But somewhere along the way, if your day, if your day at any given day is all about Jesus Christ, if my day, if I, if I were, um, can't think of anything exciting right now. You get older, you know, you sort of lose those things. But if, when I was, if, let's say I was going to go play pebble and, and um, spyglass and I was going to go up there and I had a special trip going up there. And you guys, we were all messed around doing what I, I'd be telling, hey, I'm going to go play pebble and, and I'm going to go play, you know, so and so. You know, if you were going to go to the U.S. Open in New York, Gene, and you tell, I remember, you know, or I'm going to go to Wimbledon, right? And you start talking about that kind of a thing. It's, it's just, what are you going to do? What are you excited about today? Okay. Are you excited about the fact that you get to walk with Jesus today? Are, are you going to be, are you the kind of guy who just, you know, I, I remember, I'll tell you one and we'll close. It's, it's, we're, we're getting to the end here. Um, I played in a lot of golf tournaments and stuff like that. Some nice ones, some big ones, you know, state amateur and qualifying. I didn't make it, try to qualify for the U.S. Open. And you're under pressure and you're playing along. And I, then I played in club championships and other things and various little things. But all, you, everyone, you know, you'll hear a guy go, he uses the Lord's name in vain. You know, something happens and they'll cry out, you know, not exactly the best way to hear it when they say Jesus Christ. Did you notice that all different I heard this the other day on the radio, so good, that all the different languages all over the world, if somebody wants to really curse, they have no trouble saying the name of Jesus Christ. All religions everywhere, that's the general one you roll on. You know why? It, it, it's really interesting. Well, it, well, my experience is this. I remember a guy doing that one time, and he'd done it like three holes out of like eight holes. He'd done something like that. I think I was on the eighth hole and he did it again. And, and I went like this. I, I, I just was over to the side like this. Nobody's around. I went, praise the Lord out loud. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And they looked at me. I said, hey, man, I'm standing over here. You go over there and do what you're going to do. I'm going to do. I'm going to be praising him. You can go over there and curse him. I, I don't want to be standing next to you, you know, supposedly when the lightning bolt hit. You know, I mean, I didn't say that, but that was the end. And they got they got it. They got it. You know. You're going to curse God, and I'm going to bring honor and glory and praise to God. Because, you know, the Old Testament is all full of places. You remember the old deal? You don't sword fight with Superman? I'm not going to badmouth God. It's just not an appropriate thing to do when you're a human, and he's God, and you're a sinner, and it's all about his mercy and grace, and then you're going to curse the one who died on the cross for your sins. I think we need to identify with Christ in the appropriate manner, don't you? That's what we're talking about here. We have a lot to talk about. This is, this is. I, I'm so full of things and passages and everything. It, it's just exciting to, uh, to go through John 15 with you. And we'll just, Lord Jesus, thank you for this time. I love you, Lord. Please help us, Lord, to be sober-minded, to have a good attitude, to stay with your word, to focus on you, Lord Jesus, to bring the message, Lord, for these men and their families, Lord. We pray. Thank you, Jesus, that you came as the Lamb of God and gave your blood and your body. You paid the price for our sin. You took the wrath for our sin upon yourself and gave your blood and your body, and you died for us. And then you walked out of that grave on the third day. Oh, Lord Jesus, what a blessing. You rose from the dead, defeating the power of sin and death in our lives, making us born again children of the living God. Our names are written in the book of life for eternity, and we do not have to fear death. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Praise God.